an idea about the uh, midterm, what's, what's going to be on the midterm, and um, maybe sample problems for the midterm. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Last time we introduced kind of the idea of optimal control problems, or what you, what are the ingredients that are needed. Um, see any questions on that? Let me start with an example of optimal control problem and more specifically a time optimal control. So, so we're trying to minimize the time when something 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 happens. Okay, so. Um, so the physical situation is very simple. This is supposed to be a straight line. Um, and I have an object moving. Mass is 1. So basically Newton's law says uh, mass times acceleration equals force, right? Uh, so the force that are acting on this is simply a uh, so the control is actually exerted by as a force okay so the control variable is if you want the magnitude of this force okay force is a vector right but magnitude is um, well not even magnitude so 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 let me say they're rest restricted to, so with constraints that uh, use between negative one and one. Okay. Okay. So you can ex you exert a force of maximum strength, uh, maxim uh, the magnitude. Uh, can be one on either direction. So it could be right a pulling or a pushing force, if you want to think about it like that. Um, and the state, uh, the dynamics. So if you want to, is given by this second order equation. Right? X is a function of time, is the position of the object at time t. I don't know, X is a, X, oops. So there's an, an origin at some point, right? X equals zero. And, um, You're exerting a force, a magnitude one at most in either direction, and what the goal is. So the objective is to um, bring the object at a standstill uh, at x equals zero and minimum time. Okay. So uh so how should I maybe maybe the picture is not too um so just if here, if, if I if I plotted zero here, I really want the force to be. Well, actually, we don't know, right? Um, the object might be moving to the right, to the left, and so would like to apply a braking force, right? So, uh, uh, so that it kind of slows down, right? 
But maybe if the, the, the speed of the object is too high initially, what happens? You only have this much strength to apply, right? So even if you apply the maximum force, the object may actually decelerate but go beyond zero, right? So what you want the goal is to bring the object at zero at uh, with speed zero in minimum time, right? So in other words is minimize T, right, over all admissible controls which are negative one less than or equal than u less than or equal than one, right? Such that x f t is zero and x prime of t is zero. So at final time, let me put dot here. Is zero. So, so this is the final time. Okay, the final state. Okay, so the first thing is we want to um, represent this as a dynamical system, right? So, so first we write um, the dynamical system using the state variables x1 which is the position and x2 which is the velocity okay okay so why do I call this a state space the, the state variables and then the state uh, the, the the state space because the moment I've at a, at a fixed time t the moment I've, I've identified the position and the velocity I know the st the state of the system right so this system has two degrees of freedom if you want there are two variables uh, the values of which at each time t determine the system at time t right it's a very simple system but I need two of them. I cannot just, right? If I only know the position, but I don't know the velocity, that this means I don't know the, syst uh, the state of the system. Okay. All right. So, so what is the uh, what is the dynamical system? dx1 dt, and what is dx2 dt? Well, dx1 dt is the derivative of, of the position, and that's the velocity, so it's x2. I don't know how obvious this is, or do, do I, if I need to go through. But this is simply writing us uh, an equation that's second order, differential equation, as a system of first order equations, right? So simply, I, I say, um, because of the choice of those variables, the first equation is is a restating of, of the relation between x1 and x2. The second equation is actually is a restating of the dynamics of x1 double prime is which is x2 prime, right? So this is x1 double prime and this is u, right? So maybe maybe if I hmm? Uh, so no, because this is x. I, see, I, th I think the system is is this, right? Again, you're thinking of the picture here. Well, I'm always considering the u as being in the in the direction of x, so. So if u is negative, then it's going to be a, a force applied in the opposite direction. Okay, but if if you, if, if that's this, the 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 meaning of u, um, or the the, uh, the 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 notation for u, then it's it's just that. Okay, so this is again this is just x dot and this is x double dot. Okay.
So the system is kind of fairly, fairly simple. Uh, well, simple looking. Okay, but remember what what do we um, what are we actually trying to to achieve with with writing it like a system like this? Well, we'd like to imagine of the trajectory in the phase plane. So in the starting with an initial condition. So I should have said that uh, we always have an initial condition that we start with, right? So initial condition initially at time zero. We assume x. One, uh, excuse me, x. So the position is given, and the velocity is given. Zero and x dot is v zero, right? So this means we have something at time zero, right? And we have some evolution. Depending on what what our choice of u should be will be, right? So we can. What are, what are the admissible controls? Anything between negative one and one, right? So we could we could have different paths, right? Depending on what u is, and we'll we'll talk about what you know a few sample controls, a few uh, admissible controls. But we could we could go from that initial condition in many different ways. The goal is to reach to the origin and not anyhow but in minimum time possible, right? So we're trying, it's kind of a target, right? We're targeting the origin, but how? By following the vector field that's generated by this dynamical system, right? And, and keeping in mind that you, we need to decide on what you has to be, okay? So, um, for example, uh, take u to be always 1 for some time, for some time interval. Okay, what does it mean? This means that dx1 dt is x2 and dx2 dt is 1. So we can actually solve this. Or, I mean, it doesn't have, we, do, we don't have to go to a, a p-plane necessarily to, um, to do this, right? Because x2 is then going to be what? t plus a constant, right? So again, I want to remind you, this really is saying I'm solving the second order equation in x, x double, uh, the acceleration equals always 1, right? So if I have it at an initial condition, x of 0 is some x naught, and x dot is v naught, then you can find out what the um, constant is, right? So x2 of 0 is v0 implies that the constant is v, v0, right? So you see, you actually solve for x2. x2 is t plus v0, OK? Well, I'm just giving an example of an admissible control. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, next, we'll take u to be negative one. Okay. Okay. You see, sometimes if your initial condition is that it's it's shooting to the left really fast, then you might need to actually pull it with a positive u. So. You will see that at some time you may actually have to, to juggle between the two values. 
Okay, but but I just want to show you on this on this face portrait uh, how how it actually looks for this value of u. So this is so you can do it by hand. This is a point, and once you have x two, you can go to x one and solve this. X one of t is going to be what one half t squared plus v naught t plus another constant, let's call it d, right? And what is, how do you find the uh, constant d from the initial condition for x1? So this is going to get d equals x0, right? Probably have done this in your physics courses uh, a long time ago. So I'm going to pull a p-plane in a second so you can see how this uh, various solutions might look like, but the, the computation here is fairly easy to uh, make it also by by hand. Okay, so this is x1 of t and x2 of t is so these are the two boxed equations give you the x1 and x2 as a function of t, right? Now these are the parametric equations of a solution curve in the in the phase plane, right? So how would you plot these if you were given an initial condition? Hmm? Like this. What would, what would the curve look like? Remember, it's always hard. Uh, when, when the curve is given parametrically, this means at each t, this is the x1 and that's the x2, right? But what's the x1 versus x2 that takes some additional work, right? right. Wouldn't you just select a value of t and then calculate the value for x1 and for x2 and then plot the different points? Different points, right? So you could select a bunch of a bunch of values for t, and that's how the computer does it too, right? When you when you plot something parametrically. Um, but in this case, it's fairly easy to see that you can well, and this is very rare, right? But here you can eliminate t. So you can replace, uh, you can find t in terms of x2, and then plug it back in here. So what you'll see is you'll see that x1 is a quadratic function of x2. So that's uh, already giving, uh, it's giving you a hint of how the solution will look like. They will look, they will be, actually, x1 is a is kind of a parabola, but it's tilted, right? Because x1 is a is a quadratic function of x2. Right? So this is basically how the solutions will look like. And of course, the direction is also going to be given by the trajectory is going to be given by the, by the, by the direction field. So um, you can probably guess, because dx2 dt is 1, this means x2 is always increasing. Right? So it means it's always going this way. Okay? You can convince yourselves by by plotting this uh, direction field. So it's x1 is, we said it's what is x2, and x2 is u, and u is 1, right? The origin is right here, right? Okay. And the picture should be, I don't know, maybe more symmetric. Okay. So again, uh, somebody gives you an initial condition, that's the plot of the solution. Back, I mean, uh, forward in time and backward in time. Yeah? So obviously, if, if x1, let's see, no, if x2 is positive, if your initial velocity is positive, meaning you're moving in the increasing direction of x, with applying a, a, a force equal to 1, you will never stop, right? But, but, but you see that if you are actually on the negative side of x2, so if you have a negative velocity, right? 
And it is likely that he can apply a positive U and stop. In fact, there's a very special solution here. And I'm going to plot it backward in time. That starts at the origin. Well, where's the origin? Uh, this one, right? So there's actually a whole set of initial conditions that if you start along this curve, what, what's going to happen with your solution as time goes in, increases? It's going to go this way. Eventually, it's going to go to 0, 0, right? And of course, if then you continue applying the force, it's going to keep moving away, right? So what strategy is, is, a strategy is, is if your initial condition is, you see x, x1, that's the position, is positive. You're to the, so here's the origin, you're to the right of the origin, right? But you have a negative velocity, and if it's just right, right, by applying that force of 1, you're going to actually, after some time, hit the origin with velocity 0. And then, then you stop pulling, right? Now, that's, uh, in essence, that's really the only way you can reach the goal of being at the origin with velocity zero if you apply uh, u equals one all the time. Okay? So you start here, you know, say, say this is your initial condition, right? And you, you only have the option of applying u equals one, well, you're going to get zero there, right? So it's not a question of minimum time, right? It's just a one, only one way to do it. If you are forced to always apply the control to be one, but as I said, you're you're not always forced to apply a control equal to one. You may actually apply control equal to negative one, or negative a half, or negative three quarters, and so forth, right? And that's going to apply for points that are actually outside of this very special line here. Okay, so. Um, so back here, it's, I'm going to identify this as being a very special kind of set of, like this piece of a parabola. By the way, all these parabolas should be, uh, I think they're translates of each other. They don't really show on my picture, but they should show like here, right? And again, you can, actually, maybe not, huh? Maybe, maybe not. So, so really, the um, to, uh, to to figure that out, you'd have to find so express x1 in terms of x2, and I think you get something of this type. Well, I don't have it written down here, but what you have to do is you have to find t to be x2 minus v naught, so you get x1 as one half x two minus v naught squared plus v naught x two minus v naught plus x naught. So Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so I don't think that's necessarily translate of each other, right? Because there's going to be an x two times v naught here. Uh, hold on. No, actually, I think it cancels. So, so let's let's write this as one half x two squared minus twice x two v naught, but plus. Uh, one half of that plus v naught x two that's cancelled, so it's plus one half v naught squared minus v naught squared plus x naught. So it is a translate. Of so once you have one one uh, parabola, then all the others are translates of, of that one, right? So my pictures does, doesn't uh, do a good job, but you can see it here. Okay. 
Any questions on this? I want to switch to u equals negative 1. And, and just to show you how easy it is to, you know, I mean, of course, when you have this, you just put negative 1. And redo the same thing. And what you'll see is you'll see that, well, x2 is equal to, the derivative is negative 1, so x2 is always decreasing, so it's going down, right? And then the parabolas are kind of pointing, pointing the other way around. Okay. So, for um, u equals negative one, the corresponding face uh, portrait looks looks this way, right? And again, these are translates of each other, so. Of course, they don't self they don't intersect, and they go down, right? And again, there is actually a special set of initial conditions that, if you are there, all you need to do is apply x u the the, the control to be negative one to get to the origin in a certain amount of time, right? Okay, so now what do you think needs to happen? Well, now basically you have to decide um, among, you know, the strategy for you. You can be anywhere in between negative one and one. So you can imagine if you allow you to be kind of varying between negative one and one, then of course you cannot plot a, a, for, a phase portrait anymore because it would be a non-autonomous system, right? But the solution would have to kind of fit that time changing uh, direction field which we cannot plot right so um, here's here's the idea though once you have those two is as the combining the two face portraits makes an artist um, or, or brings the artist uh, from from each of you uh, so so I'm gonna just kind of identify these two curves which are um, we're gonna later call them switching curves okay and So the face portrait is for u equals plus 1 and u equals negative 1. But of course, keep in mind, this is not, you can, you can, you are allowed, admissible control is you could have a half, right? For a while. And changing, right? So, so what I'm doing here is very kind of limited still um, until we talk about this maximum principle. So I'm going to anticipate, I'm going to tell you that this maximum principle that we're going to uh, introduce is going to say, in this particular problem, your optimal control strategy is to use the extreme, plus, plus 1 and minus 1 only for some periods of, of time, and then with some switching in between. Okay? So here's the illustration of that. So for instance, if your initial condition is somewhere here, Okay, that's at time zero. How do you think you will achieve, if you only had the possibility of using plus or minus one for your control, how are you going to get to zero? Hmm? Well, first of all, you're going to have to kind of catch the ride on a, on a parabola that, that points to the right, which corresponds to u equals negative one, right? So, so, so it's like you look at the two face portraits and you see how can I go, right? Well, why, why like this? Well, because you you're going to actually hit this this half of the parabola in some finite time. Remember, x two is going with velocity uh, negative one, so it's it's not like kind of lingering here, right? It's just going kind of steadily 
So at some point it's going to hit this, right? Once it hits this, I'm just going to catch the ride using u equals plus 1. And because we talked about a special curve here, you're going to actually hit 0, 0 in a finite amount of time, right? So that's a strategy, right? In fact, if you had only the choice of plus and minus 1, this would be the only strategy. Because if you start here and you start with u equals plus 1, well, actually, no, I take it back. It won't be the only strategy. Right? In principle, you could, you could start, so I'm going to use a different color here, maybe. You could start um, with plus 1, so you're going to follow some, some sort of a trajectory that's parabola pointing the, the other way, right? You could start positive, but then you could go negative, and then you could go right. It's just going to take a lot longer. So it's not going to be optimal in that sense, right? So if you only had these two possibilities, plus or minus one, you could actually imagine you could. I mean, you could have various ways in which you 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 uh, you achieve that stopping. Uh, task, but with lots of you know wandering around. Okay, so you kind of see from this picture that this is going to be the, the optimal. I mean, to reach the origin, you have to land on this curve at some point. And the sooner you land, the, the right, the smaller the time. So this is going to be actually the, the optimal strategy. Start negative for this initial condition. Start negative you and then switch to positive u once. Okay? So if x1 is positive, you set the switch to a negative? If x1 is positive, but above this curve. Okay. So x2 has also has to be somehow, right? Because if you are below here, so I'm going to use blue again, uh, so this is going to be optimal. Oops. But if you are starting here, you see you won't be able to, because if you start negative, you keep going down, right? Whereas remember, it's best to kind of catch this other branch in fastest time possible, in quickest time. So, so you will start with equals positive one, and then negative one, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Exactly. So, so, and it's not intuitive. I agree. So, in other words, what I'm saying here is, if you choose any other, any other um, values of u between one zero is sticking between negative one and one, you will arrive. You know, you may arrive at that. Uh, that stopping point, but the time it will take is going to be longer than than using this. Okay, so this will, will be not optimal. Okay. Okay. So this principle, this maximum principle, is actually uh, um, is stating that, and it has a proof and all that. But I mean, we won't be talking about the proof. Okay. Um, now, there's a better example which you probably uh, experience a lot, quite a lot, when you um, swing, well, somebody else, I guess. Or you can swing, you know, go on a swing, right? And uh, you imagine like, okay, you have a child, right, and that you're swinging. And what you want is you want to bring that child to a, to a stop in shortest amount of time, right? What do you do? You're going to apply. Uh, uh, well, we're going to let's imagine there's no resistance to uh, to air. It's just basically it's a it's a harmonic oscillator. So there would be x double double prime plus x equals u. Okay. What you ha what you do then is you actually 
um, you say you have a certain limited amount of force you can apply, right? What's going to happen is you're going to have to uh, switch between pulling and pushing, depending on the position of the, of the swing, sev possibly several times to achieve the full stop, okay? But depending on the initial condition, that determines the number of switches. Uh, the picture would be a little bit more complicated, but uh, anyway, uh, let me just mention that. So, so stopping a pendulum is kind of the next com complex problem. Oops. So x double dot um, plus x equals zero, and let's say I also have this force, right? Pendulum or spring mass, whatever, right? So right now you have some. So either either is a pendulum or spring mass, but it kind of it moves both both directions, right? Um, so think about the dynamical system that you that you get. Well, you get this when you when you think when you think about the extremes only. If you use one, what's going to be x double prime plus x equals one? And what's the face portrait for this one? Well, x double prime plus x equals zero gives you this cosine and sine, right? Which are concentric circles around the origin. Except here, what's the steady state? The steady state is when x position is 1 and velocity is 0. So it's kind of concentric circles. So again, this is x1 versus x2. But center around this point. OK? And I, I don't know, the, I think the counterclockwise probably, it's how they rotate, right? Cosine and sine. Okay, whereas if u is negative one, the steady state is going to be at negative one and zero, and this is going to be the concentric circles, right? So when you do the combined uh, face portrait, uh, it's going to be quite tricky. But imagine like I'm I'm at this initial uh, condition, right? So x1, x2. So position is positive and velocity is positive. So it's the pendulum is swinging away from the vertical, right? Or if you want to think about a spring mass, it's the spring is right, right. It's kind of to the right, and it's moving away from this. Obviously, you would like to uh, apply a negative u, right? So you're going to be moving along, and I, I forgot to uh, mention here what's the direction of this. Uh, clockwise. Uh, still okay. So it's x1, dx1, d2 is x2, dx2, dt is minus x1 minus 1. Okay, the other one is plus 1. Uh, so let's see if if x1 is if x1 is positive, both x1 and x2 is positive. X1. is increasing when x2 is positive, right? So actually counterclockwise here and possibly so excuse me, clockwise on both both directions, I think. Okay, so you're going to be moving clockwise, but you're going to be kind of trying to to circle around this this one, right? Yep. 
And if you always keep negative 1, you will never actually reach the origin, unless in a very special case when you are on a circle that goes to the origin, right? So at some point, you're going to have to hitch the ride on a circle that's concentric with respect to this one. Right? And hopefully, let's say this is one. So, so there, is, there are these two special circles, right? Eventually, you have, to, you have to land on a circle that's centered at 1, 0, or at negative 1 and 0, that goes to the, you know, that's tangent to the, that, that contains the origin. So, so you see, if I'm going here, I'm going to go this way, and maybe I should exaggerate this a little bit so you can see. So let's see, my initial condition is, is, um, is at this point. So the circle that I'm trying to, yeah, so, so the circle I'm, I'm first starting on intersects this, right? Then what will be my, my optimal trajectory? I'm going this way, right? And I'm going this way. See, so only one switch. But what if I'm actually at an initial condition that's kind of, you know, my momentum and my position are kind of large enough that I won't be able to f to to stop it in one switch. Then I'm going to have to hitch uh, to catch a ride on one of the circles, right? I'm going to have to have several switches. It's a little bit. It's actually the number of switches that one is required to make for optimal control is actually a very kind of delicate problem uh, because it depends on the initial condition. Okay. So the, that's why you know we typically don't start with this kind of problems because uh, of the of the spring mass control spring mass, okay. But nevertheless, the uh, the out the outcome of this um, optimization problem is that you always need to go to the extremes, okay, for for this particular problem. No, I haven't shown you this, okay. and actually, to uh, I'll show you in a second, but it will have to follow basically this uh, strategy. I mean, this this maximum principle. Okay. Okay. So let me kind of uh, start by describing. <clears throat> so, what is the maximum principle called Pontryagin? maximum principle, commonly called PMP. Okay, so we start with the state variables. And the dynamics. So the dynamics is F, uh, dx1 dt is f1 of x1 xn and possibly control u. And dxn dt is fn of x1 xn u. I'm going to try to stay with the notation that I have in this, in this handout. Okay, and again, the state variables are x1 through xn. Once you've identified uh, the state variables at time t, you know this is the whole system, right? So depending on the system, you might need two components, or you might need seven components, or you might need one component, depending on the number of degrees of freedom. OK? So given an initial condition, x. Uh, x at time zero is some given vector, some given right. Each each component has a given value. The goal is to 
uh, find the optimal control I think I stated this uh, last time with two variables but now we're going to be a little bit more careful with the notation so we're going to find an optimal control strategy so a, a u as a function of time over some finite period of time now remember this finite amount of time may actually be part of the problem so this t might actually be part of the problem to minimize so so sometimes we fix the t terminal time t sometimes we uh, we don't fix the terminal time t okay if it's time optimal problem we don't fix it we want to minimize t capital t right in other times you fix the capital time t okay such that uh, the following uh, obje um, functional is maximized. And again, this is just a convention. If you if you have to minimize something, you just put minus minus that and you maximize it. And the most general we're going to consider is is the following: is going to be a combination, a linear combination of the final final comp final time final states uh, x1, the components of the final states. So x1 of t, x x x n of t. So it's a linear combination of those plus possibly an integral term, integral from 0 to t, of some expression involving the state variables and the control throughout the whole dynamics. Okay. Now, this is certainly not the most general uh, type of of objective function that one can uh, encounter. Like this first part here, uh, one could have some nonlinear function of the x of the states. Okay? Like I wrote last time, I call it like a G naught. Um, but, you know, I like to focus on this just linear combination of them, just because we talk about linear programming. And remember, in the linear programming, we, we were always, our objective was a linear function of the states, state values, right? So think about if, if for some problem you don't have, uh, you only have this first term. So in other words, if f naught is 0, right? Then your objective function is just like in the linear programming. What's the difference between linear programming and this problem, though? In linear programming, what were you doing? You're maximizing an objective function, a linear objective, right? given some constraints, right? But it was like a, it was a steady state. There was no dynamics, there was no time, right? You just had some constraints and you had an objective function and you wanted to uh, minimize, maximize that objective function, right? Whereas here, so, so you're trying to hit a vertex in, in, a, in a simplex, right? Simplex was defined by the uh, constraints, right? Here it's kind of similar idea except you're trying to kind of reach the vertex where this is maximized, right? You don't necessarily have a simplex. What you have is you have a dynamics that you start at some initial condition and you're trying to kind of hit a vertex where something is maximized, okay? And hitting that was kind of following a dynamical system rather than a, um, I mean, in linear programming, it didn't have any dynamical system. It was simply kind of a um, static or, or steady state. Okay? The only constraint that, that that is happening here is actually on the on the control, possibly. Okay. So finally, um, among among the following function to maximize among um, all admissible controls. You know, U 
of T belonging to some set. Uh, I don't know if I call it S, but we call S when we talk about linear programming and we said that's the feasible set, right? So there we had a feasible set, here we have a feasible, a set of feasible controls, possible, it's a functions of time. Okay, so this is kind of a grand picture, it's kind of, I mean, I'm not really expecting you to, to say, oh yeah, of course, if it's in any program, I can do that, I can deal with this, right? Um, not only because it has this extra kind of complication that you have this extra term here, right? Um, but also because of what comes next. So this is a formulation of the problem, okay? Every problem that we're going to be dealing with in this chapter, just like before, we're going to try to fit it with this approach, okay? We're, kind of, we're going to try to fit it in this mold of identifying the things that we need, okay? So here's a PMP. Okay, you ready? And you'll see how nicely it kind of gives us the answer uh, for that first problem and, and others. So, so it says, construct first the so-called uh, Hamiltonian And this Hamiltonian has a lot of variables. It's a function of, of many variables. Um, and I'm going to try to group them. The order doesn't quite matter, but uh, let's group them by n. So there are first, there are n variables first that I'm going to call them size, and I'll tell you in a second what size are. The next n variables are the, n, are the x, so these are the state variables. And the last one is the control variable, right? And by definition, this is what is going to be psi1 f1 plus psi2 f2 plus, and so forth, psi n fn plus f0. So you recognize all this. So, so what is F1? This is the right-hand side of the state variables, right? Of the state of the state of dynamical system, right? The F1, F2, Fn. What is F0? F0 is this guy that, as I said, may or may not appear in the in the objective function. If it doesn't appear it means f0 is 0, right? But if it does appear, then that's the f0 that, that you need to uh, add to that, to those, those terms, right? Okay? So let me, uh, let me uh, introduce this, these guys here. So, sorry about that. So, so here, psi1, psi n are called adjoint variables x1, xn are the state variables and what are these adjoint variables? adjoint can I call them shadow variables? Adjoint is a fancy mathematical term, but we've talked about shadow prices. We've talked about Lagrange multipliers. These are exactly those kind of things. They're things that kind of lurk and have some meaning, but we won't need them un unless we, I mean, we, we will work with them, but not need them unless explicitly asked by the problem, okay? So I want you to think of it as a Lagrange multiplier. In fact, it is a Lagrange multiplier. In many places you see this principle, they don't use psi, they use lambdas, okay? Just to be more, more, more illustrative, but um, I figure lambdas would make uh, things a little bit more confusing. But, so they are Lagrange multipliers, and 
Again, not, not that I expected to, to say, oh, yeah, of course, that's... Now I understand what they are, okay? Because I didn't tell you what they actually satisfy. So the Psi variables satisfy an adjoint system, dynamical system. as follows. So it's d psi j d t is minus partial of h with respect to x j. j starts from 1 to n. Now, this is getting actually now uh, weird because well, first of all, I wrote this system as in compact form. So what, is, what, it, what, it, what this really means is d psi 1 dt is minus partial of h with respect to x1. d psi n dt is minus partial of h with respect to xn. Agree with that? So it's a system, but the right-hand side of this system involves H. And H was something that was defined in terms of size. Right? So, so when one needs to understand how this, this is actually done, um, well, think about what is the partial of H with respect to X1. In this, in this guy here, what, th that's h, right? So when you differentiate with respect to x1, where is x1 going to be hidden? Well, x1 is hidden in f1, in f2, fn, in the f's, right? So when you take the partial with respect to, a, to each x, the psi will be left alone, and they're going to be linear, OK? So the point is that this system, no matter how complicated, and it's not explicit really, it doesn't tell you what psi is explicitly, but it will be a, a linear system. So this is going to be a linear system of, a linear dynamical system in psi. Okay, and we'll see an example in a second. So this is kind of the most important thing. This is linear in psi 1, psi 2, Psi n. Now, why am I saying it's important? What do we know about linear, a dynamical system that is linear? Can be solved. Okay. Now, uh, it will not be autonomous, unfortunately, always, most of the time. Okay. Um, actually, I'm, uh, that's not true. I mean, in principle, it can be solved because as a linear system, you can exponentiate the, ma the metrics of the coefficient and figure that out. But in practice, it may still be hard to, to, to solve this, right? But just the idea that you can solve this system for psi should give you a comfort of, of what the psi's are. I mean, these psi's come out of solving a linear system. Okay? So, if the first time I, I wrote this psi, probably you got shocked by, you know, what are they? At least now you should think about, okay, these psi's are some shadow variables that are obtained from solving a linear system. Okay? And again, we'll, we'll, we'll see this in, in, in each example. Uh, it may be a little bit different, but you will see the, what am I saying here. So, so it can be solved explicitly. Okay? With one caveat. So, when you have a system and you try to solve it, what do you need? You have a differential equation. How do you solve a differential equation? Well, you can find the general solution, right? But if you, if you, not, if you want a specific solution, you need to impose some initial conditions, right? 
Right, at some time you need to, to, need to specify the size, right? Well, so here's the important thing is it can be solved explicitly given initial conditions but now I'm gonna cross initial and I'm gonna call terminal so everything's kinda upside down um, these terminal conditions are this psi 1 at capital T psi 2 at capital T psi n at capital T Okay, so let me. So some somehow we need to know what this what these size are at, at at the final time t. And if you look at this cheat sheet here, there are two cases that I'm listing, and and, and these are not the only two cases. But case one says fixed terminal time and free terminal state. Okay, so so in this. In this kind of scenario, we have a problem where we're given to optimize something over a fixed term, uh, time period, but we don't know the terminal time, the, the terminal state of the system, right? So this is in contrast to the term, to the um, time time control problem, time optimal control, where you you don't know the time over which the dynamics takes place, but you know the terminal state you want it to be a certain like the origin right okay so so in the case one which is which is uh, fixed so fixed terminal state excuse me terminal time Not my friend here. So fixed terminal time t. Um, this is kind of funny. The terminal, the the terminal conditions of this adjoint system are to be taken exactly those constants that appear in the functional in the in the, in the function so in the objective functional okay the constants that come in front of the of the objective functional okay and the uh, time optimal in the case two time optimal problem there are no terminal conditions explicitly imposed you can you can think like this um, so the time optimal problem has some fixed terminal time for for the state variable x. So for these for that dynamical system, you have initial conditions and you have terminal conditions for the x. So you don't need any for the actually psi. The only one that's needed is is uh, is that h, the Hamiltonian at the terminal time t is equal to zero. Okay. So Anyway, so so far we, unfortunately, we're not done with this. Um, I've only introduced you this variable its size. Okay, so only introduced the variable size. So here's the key step. So imagine like now you're comfortable with, of building that function Hamiltonian H. Where size are you know some some shadow variables. But now here's the key step. The key step says for each fixed t between, you know, uh, the time period where you're doing this, pro this problem, choose 
the U star, the value of the optimal control that maximizes H as a function of U. H as a function of U. Among all admissible uh, values for U. Okay? So, this is pretty much nonsense until we, see, we do an example. So, let, let's, let's go back to our example. And you'll see, again, the only way to learn this kind of steps or to apply these steps to a new problem is to go through a few examples. So, we'll start with a very simple one like this, right? The first step is to identify the state variables, right? And we've done that x1, x2, and we write the, the, the state, the dynamical system, right? Okay? So now, with a different color, I'm going to... So this is the f1, this is f2, right? Of x1, x2, and u. x1, x2, and u. At this point, I wanted to stop me with any anything. Okay? All right, so I have two variables. I have f1, f2, which I've, I've identified. So right off the bat, I'm going to write this Hamiltonian. H psi 1, psi 2, x1, x2, and u. Let's see, can somebody tell me what it is? <clears throat> psi 1, f1, so that's x psi 1, x2, correct? Psi so psi 2, F2, which is U. Oh, and I didn't tell you what um, objective function we had, right? We had time optimal problem, right? So that was what? J was so time optimal problem. Uh, was to minimize t, right? So what it, what is in standard like in standard form? This uh, it was to maximize j, which was minus t, right? Which is the integral of minus one from zero to t dt. So this is f naught, right? So remember f naught. So this is minus one. So we need that as well, right? Okay, so this is the, this is a function of five variables. Uh, well, yeah, five variables, right? But really, x one doesn't show. Okay, so adjoint system. So I'll tell you, this this can can be done like, I mean, it's almost algorithmically. It can be done without any emotional. Involvement really. Uh, the psi one dt is minus partial of h with respect to x one. But what is that? There's no x one in h. So partial of h with respect to x one is zero, right? And the uh, psi two dt is minus. I mean, this minus is important, by the way. Many of these things, I mean, have reasons beyond, way beyond. Um, I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to kind of talk about it in, in class uh, because of the time, but um, at some point, a natural to ask, you know, why, why any of this, right? Why is this working? Well, think about it as, as it's kind of the same question. Why, uh, when you look for maxima or minima, you take derivative set it equal to zero, okay? It's the same thing, except here there are seven steps, rather than one step or two steps, right? Okay, and um, okay. So 
let me finish this. So this is this is minus, and what is partial of h with respect to x two? So I one, right? So so this, this system is 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 incredibly easy, right? Because I mean it's obviously linear, but you don't need to do any exponentiation or anything to solve it, right? Now let's postpone that. We know we can solve it. We know psi one and psi two can be solved, right? We don't have terminal conditions or initial conditions, so there's going to be some things that are uncertain at this point, right? And let's go to the to the key step. What did I say? How should we choose a, a u, the value of u, to maximize? So to, to maximize h as a function of u alone. I should have said that. So look at that h, and you see what? Whereas u, uh, u only appears as a, in one, one term, and as, as a linear term, right? So I forgot to, you know, I, I mean, I, we talked about all the constraints. What, what was the admissible constraints? The admissible uh, controls, the, f the feasible set, negative one to one, right? So what you're having here is having a linear function of u that has to be maximized over a finite interval. So find u such that u star, right? Such that h of u star maximizes this 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 function of u okay nothing easier than that since h is linear in u it can either be so i'm plotting h what do i mean of u alone it means i freeze everything else time is frozen x2 x1 x2 psi1 psi2 are frozen so all you have is you have some sort of a linear function between negative 1 and 1, right? And a linear function can either be increasing or decreasing, right? So how do you maximize? This is a one-dimensional constraint optimization problem. How do you maximize a linear function over a finite interval? It's one of the endpoints. You don't take the derivative and set it equal to 0. Because if it's linear, the derivative, unless the, it's flat, right? Uh, but if it's, if it's not constant, you know, at all constant, then you don't take the derivative set equal to set equal to zero, right? If this were not linear, then that, that's what you do, right? You would take the derivative with respect to u, set equal to zero, okay? So the first problem in the homework uh, if you read it carefully, there won't be any, there are not any constraints on you. So, it, which means at this step, what you have is you have to maximize h over the whole line, right? All values of u. But guess what? h will not be linear. And how do we know it will not be linear? We're, just take a look at that problem. Uh, we're trying to minimize this objective function, right? So do you see that h is not going to be linear in u? Because inside that integral, the f naught is u squared. In fact, it's going to be minus u squared. Minus u squared, right? Because, because we're minimizing. So the first thing to do is to convert everything to maximizing, right? So then f naught is minus u squared, right? Then h is going to be a function of a linear term with u and minus u squared. So that's a parabola upside down. That has a maximum, right? So this is going to be accomplishable. Possible, right? But here, because u is, h is linear, you have either u equals 1 or u equals u star is either 1 or negative 1. 
Who decides whether it's plus or minus 1? So it's minus 1 if... Who decides if, if, if h is increasing or decreasing? Psi 2. Right? So, so this is if psi 2 is how? Negative, right? Then it's decreasing, so the maximum occurs at the left-hand point, negative 1. And it's 1 if psi 2 is positive. OK? So, so now what, what do you need to do? Well, pretty much you've, 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 just, you've, you've, uh, you've uh, established that the optimal control has to have one of the two extremes, plus or minus 1. The only thing that's not established yet is when is plus minus when is plus one and when is minus one. Well, for that you have to solve psi two, right? Psi two you solve that adjoint system, and I won't do it now. But um, let's see. I think I think in one of the handouts, the first handouts, um, you see that worked out in example one at least. Okay. So, so you just solve for psi. You can see psi one is constant, right? Psi two is going to be the integral of a constant, so it's going to be linear. Psi two is linear, right? So psi two changes sign only once. That's basically saying you have you always have to change in this problem from negative one to positive one, or from positive one to negative one, only once. So that's why that combined face portrait is all you need. Okay. Okay. So again, try to look through those examples, identify at least up to this point the Hamiltonian adjoint system and when how to pick u star. U star is going to be when h has to be maximized. Okay? And we'll come back on on Monday. Thank you.